Well, hello, hello, hello. Just waiting for everybody to start coming through. We will be going live with Kim in a few minutes. So I'm just here getting ready for everybody to come on board. And we get to talk about hyenas today. So we just have one more minute until we we officially start and then we will have Kim Walata, who we will be talking to today. It's going to be an exciting, exciting conversation that we will be having here. Just waiting for everybody to come through. Hello, everyone. Hello, Guy Jennings. Hello, John. Hi, Miriam. How are you? Wilding in Africa. Hello, Lauren. How are you? So we are just about to get started and we're going to be waiting for Kim. Kim Walliter, who is going to be joining us shortly as our guest. And we will be talking to him about the hyena. And Guy has requested a video. Hello. Okay. Well, good to see you, Guy. I've got to see your face. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Miriam. I'm good. I'm very well. I'm excited to be here. Uh, we're just waiting for Kim to also come through and then we let him in. And how is Los Angeles, Miriam? Excited to have you here as part of our live today. And excited to be talking about what we'll be talking about is going to be very exciting. So we will be waiting for Kim to just also join in and then we'll get to start talking about why we're here. And yeah, so it's six o'clock. Hi, everyone. So my name is Rumbi Takawira. You should all follow me as well on Instagram. It's Rumbi Takawira, R-U-M-B-I-E Takawira. And I am Wild AIDS Zimbabwe ambassador. So Zimbabwe is in Africa and uh, it's a country that boasts of a huge population of the big five. It has the second largest population of elephants in the entire world. And we also have the fourth largest uh, population of black rhinos. They are also on the verge of extinction in, uh, in, in Africa, in the whole world. So Zimbabwe is a conduit um, so to speak, it's a very important, important piece within the conservation conversation if we're talking about anything to do with conservation. And Kim Walata is here. So um, I will be introducing you to our guest for today. In Zimbabwe, in my country, uh, we want to talk about hyenas. And Kim is a well-renowned filmmaker and he is also Emmy nominated and he's done so many great films and he also encounters hyenas. So you're like, okay, he took us to a hyena den when we went into the Save Valley here in the Low Belt in Zimbabwe. He took us to the Save Valley and we got to see him encounter these hyenas. These are wild hyenas, not tame or anything. These are wild hyenas. And he went and literally started petting a hyena. I looked at him and I was like, mm -mm, I'm not about to do that. But in my culture, in Zimbabwe, in my country, hyenas are seen as um, animals that are used by witches, yes, for witchcraft. So I posted on my Twitter and I asked my people, um, what have you heard about hyenas? What do you know about hyenas? What are the myths? What are the misconceptions? And the majority of the responses I was getting where definitely hyenas are used for witchcraft. So we're here to debunk most of these myths, most of these mysteries. And I'm hoping that Kim, if you can come through, if you can just request to join the video, um, and then we can get you in. There you go. So we will be talking to Kim. He helps us understand. I mean, who better to talk to about 
uh, hyena behavior than the hyena whisperer himself. That's what we've decided to call him, the hyena whisperer. And so Kim actually moves around and walks around with no shoes, even when we're in the bushes. He literally will not be wearing any shoes. And I'm not too sure how he's dealt with any thorns and all sorts. But Kim, hi, how are you? Good evening. Can you hear me? I can now. Yes, sorry. I'm just going through some, <laughs> some testing here. I'm here. All yours. Sorry. Amazing, Kim. <laughs> How are you? Hello. I'm fine. How are you? It's just damn cold. It's freezing. Oh, my goodness. I can imagine freezing in the Sabe Valley. I yeah. know. It was 40 degrees yesterday. And it was minus 40 talk about a huge change but so i was telling everyone that you do not wear shoes um even when you're walking out in the bush and i don't understand what the reason is for that so to just start us off the icebreaker kim walita tell us about your shoe issue i'm thinking about starting a gofundme just to get you a pair of shoes if you can't afford some <laughs> Yeah, I would appreciate it. That's the problem, yes. I just can't afford it. Uh -huh. no, 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 I like to feel connected to our natural world. You know, when you see what, because I'm dealing with soft-footed animals all the time, predators, hyenas, lions, leopards, mm -hmm. cheetahs. And if I want to know what they're going through, I need to feel what they're going through. And not only that, you know, when you wear shoes, you're incredibly aggressive the way you walk in the bush. You just crunch over everything. You don't care what you stand on. My every step, I'm very conscious of every step I take. And I move lightly, I tread lightly, and I can move quietly, all of that stuff. And also, there's been some research and stuff that shows that we need to be connected to, to Mother Earth every mm -hmm. now and then. There's electric magnetic waves that go through your body, and it does a lot of healing and all of that. So, yeah, that's what it's about. And Okay, know, I'm going to see if I can yeah. try that. I need to see if I can try that for at least a day when I'm with you in the bush in the Sabe Valley. Haven't you had any issues with thorns and having to deal with getting any injuries, though? Uh, well, remember that day we were running with the dog tracking poachers? We were yeah. running with them. Running next to you, there was, I was fine. I think I overtook you sometimes. I don't know. I can't remember. You know what? We're not having that discussion right now. Um, I was fine. Everything was fine. And I'm fit. And I was faster than you. But so we're talking about the hyena situation. And um, in Zimbabwe, you know how hyenas are regarded as they're used by witches. Um, there's so many different... Um, many myths around hyenas. But can you explain to us, help us understand, um, obviously within the ecosystem, every single animal has its reason, has its purpose. So looking at the hyena, talk to us a little bit, help us understand what the hyena really um, stands for within the ecosystem. Well, they, you know, they're hugely important. As much as you know, everybody talks about hyenas scavenging, and that's what they do. They're just scavengers, and they skulk around. Hyenas are actually incredible hunters, and they do a lot of, their, do a lot of hunting. But go back to the scavenging part. If there is food out there, rotten stuff, they will get rid of it. You know, there was some research done in, in Ethiopia. There was a town there, and the guys, the people were complaining that hyenas were killing their livestock, and it was costing them about $3,000 a year. Yeah. Then they did some research on what the hyenas were actually doing for the community. And any carcass that died, or any you know, cow or whatever that died of anthrax mm -hmm. or bovine TB, the hyenas were cleaning that up so that they wouldn't infect other animals. And they worked out that the hyenas were actually saving them $52,000 every year. So they were losing $3,000, but they were gaining $52,000 because they weren't getting the mm -hmm. animals infected. So there's a very real tangible benefit of hyenas. And they are very much a part of the ecosystem. They've got to keep lions under control mm -hmm. because those kitty cats just get out of hand sometimes. Those. <laughs> and, uh, so the way you say kitty cats to lions. No, I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, you have dedicated... <laughs> 
so much of your time to actually studying these animals and you studied their behavior and you've literally been living among them i think you're part of the pack obviously and we know how they're more matriarchal and the woman is the boss which is what we're trying to do now you know uh boss up it's you know it's the year of the woman yes it's the the future is female so tell us a little bit more about that kind of behavior and how it actually works within a pack well that's a problem for me because i'm a male and i'm trying to get into a female dominated society so i'm treated like nothing males in a hyena society are Absolutely nothing. They write down at oh, the bottom. Shame. And yeah. it's, it's interesting. They have the whole hierarchy where if you're born to the matriarch, you, yeah. you take on her rank. If you're a male cub born to her, you take on her rank. But then after two to three years, you leave the clan. And it just happens. They just leave. Mm -hmm. And once they leave the clan, they become a nothing. And they've got to try and join another clan and slowly work their way up, which is quite incredible. Why do they do that? And it's just an instinctive thing that happens. So, yeah, males are treated like, I mean, even when they want to mate with her, they are mm -hmm. so terrified. They come up all tenderly and then they run away again and then they approach slowly and they run. <laughs> it's hilarious. The guys are terrified. You know, I, and I need men, to get some advice from the you hyenas. Can't, <laughs> you can't rape a hyena either because... She has that appendage of her, which she has to yeah. invert, pull it inside herself to mate. So if she's not interested, game over. Mm -hmm. Doesn't happen. So we have a rough time. But there's also <laughs> that apparently the hyenas have both organs. Can you explain that? Is that actually the reality? Is that what they have? And how does that work? Well, yes, if you look at them, it's it's very hard to take the hyena. And I do not know a single professional hunter in this country who can sex a hyena. Because you have to look at that appendage. So the male's penis is long, thin thing, and it goes erect. The female mm -hmm. has exactly similar looking thing. It goes erect. It's the same length. And that's what she inverts to mate. But the only difference between the two, the male even has, the female even has testicles. But they're just filled with tissue. And the only difference is the tip of the penis and the female's pseudo Um In the females, it's rounded like your finger, and in the males, it's pointed like the head of a, of a lizard. So unless you're looking at that, you can't tell the difference. And also, the males are smaller than the girls because they, they just have to run around at the bottom and eat on the scraps. The girls are eating everything, so they're a lot bigger than the boys. But no, they, they are not the same sex in both animals. And I think that's why over the millennia all this witchcraft and stuff has come about is because mm -hmm. we used to live in caves back then and we only came out in the daytime. Yeah. So when we found a hyena, we would see one out, but we would we'd find a dead one and we'd look at it and we'd see, oh, but it's got a, a thingy. And they all had thingies. We didn't know that they were different. And that's how it's been passed on. But now we know all of that is not true. They are st definitely separate sexes and but they have this appendage that looks identical. Okay, I really needed you to explain that because I wasn't sure. I was like, how can you tell if it's male, if it's female? How does it even work out? But now I understand. And I also noticed but hang on, when we're walking... Uh-huh, so yeah? One other thing there. So she inverts that to mate, and when she gives birth, the baby comes out through that thing like a sausage. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, you got me Try there. That. You got me there. I, I would, I would not want to wait. I would want to see that, but I would also not want to see that. I don't know. I, I feel like you know what? We'll see. I'll try to Google and see how it all works out. But that's a bit freaky. But um, now, just looking at those issues around people understanding the value of the hyena. And um, Ethiopia, for example, they have found ways of finding the intrinsic and extrinsic value um, of, of, of these hyenas. And also in Nigeria as well, they've, they've sort of made it part of their tourist destination site to actually see hyenas. And they also now, they, they, they're valued 
in, in, in Ethiopia and in Nigeria. But now for us to also see this intrinsic value and also the extrinsic value of hyenas, how can we do that? What, how can we, at a time where just recently, just a few months ago, what, um, his name, uh, Rodwell, Rodwell Komazana, the boy who got mauled by, by a hyena just about three, three or so months ago, and um, he had to get assistance in South Africa. With issues like that, with the human hyena conflict, how can we strike that balance and say, okay, there's an ex extrinsic and intrinsic value, but we also have to strike a balance in dealing with that. What causes some of these attacks as well? No, it yeah, it's, it's a hard one. And, you know, I even have friends today telling me they go camping in the bush and they sleep on the ground. Well, that's just being silly. So what happened to Rodwell, you know, that was an all-night church ceremony and the adults were in the church and the kids were sleeping outside. All the kids were sleeping together and this hyena came along and grabbed him by the face. And, yeah, he was really badly mutilated. Now, hyenas are going to do that um, wherever you are. So, firstly, you shouldn't be sleeping on the ground outside. I mean, that's just a no-no. And then, you know, with livestock, livestock will always herd it and put in a pen at night. That's what, you know, we've done for, for, for many, many years. And mm -hmm. we need to keep doing that. And the, the difference between lion and leopard and a hyena coming to your livestock is for a hyena, you only need to put up a, a short little four-foot fence because a hyena can't mm -hmm. jump. Lions and leopards okay. jump right over that. But a hyena, you don't, need, you don't need much of a fence at all. So they won't get mm -hmm. in there. But, yeah, I mean, it's amazing to see how in Ethiopia these guys have, I mean, in Addis Ababa, in the city of Addis, there's a pack of some 30 hyenas living there. And mm -hmm. all, they're just feeding on the organic, organic rubbish that people throw out. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's a benefit to the people. Um, yeah. And the Ethiopians have just learn to live with these animals so they understand them and there's even the one guy there who feeds them from his mouth he has a piece of nyama in his mouth and they come and take it from him and stuff so you know they've they've turned that into something positive but they've learned they've got over that fear thing and i, I think that fear thing in the witchcraft mm -hmm. and it, it's it i don't think no it's very real and it's 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 something we've got to get around and incredibly mm -hmm. hard to get around because it's so ingrained in us. But when yeah. you see what the hyenas do with me, um, you start thinking, well, what is wrong with these guys? Are they really mm -hmm. like that? I, but hey, having said that, I won't sleep on the ground near my hyenas. I would used to do it with my cheetah and I did it with wild dogs. I would just lie there, no problem. I won't do it with hyenas because that's just, it's just inciting trouble. And we've got to be aware of those. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is education. Mm -hmm. How do these guys operate? You can manipulate the way that you, that you operate around them and, and live with them. And, you yeah. know, those people in, in Harar, in Ethiopia, they started feeding the hyenas sadza. And that stopped mm -hmm. the hyenas eating cattle and goats. And mm -hmm. then they started giving them yama. And that's how they developed their relationship. But the whole of Ethiopia seems to be like that. They understand that. Well, I like how you, you've spoken yeah. about the education aspect, the educational part of it. And Caroline here says several children have been killed by hyenas in Tanzania and Kenya for the last two years. And she's wondering what are the impacts of habituating hyenas to humans um, and to communities living alongside hyenas. So I don't know if, if that's like something that can be possible, that people just like you've been cohabiting with uh, hyenas and you've been fine and you haven't been attacked and you've understood their behavior. What do people need to understand about hyena behavior? You've spoken of, obviously you can't sleep on the ground at night out in the, in the wild and a hyena will definitely come through. But what are some of the uh, important pointers that people need to understand when they're getting into uh, an area that has hyenas? Yeah, well, I mean, a huge thing, as that lady was saying, a huge thing is children. Children are a problem. Because of their size, they're small, and hyenas, for some reason, are more attractive to these small things. Now, I don't believe a hyena actually goes out of their way to attack people. Hyena are, are taking people that are sleeping. I, I don't know of an incident where somebody was taken when they were wide awake, no adult. Mm -hmm. Youngsters, there, I've got to be very careful with my daughter Kiki when we're out the car with hyenas. I'm with her all the time, 
hasn't been a problem, but I'm very aware of those situations. So again, it's, it's an understanding, but also being aware that at night, you don't leave mm -hmm. your kids to run around the bush, <laughs> little kids on their own, like at night, mm -hmm. kids are around. And you definitely won't sleep out there on the ground. I mean, that's just an absolute no-no. So yes, it is happening and, it, and it's hugely unfortunate. And you know, what these kids go through, and I mean, what Rodwell's been through with that attack mm -hmm. and how his whole face has been disfigured and he's had six months of surgery. He's hopefully coming back in yeah. the next week or two. Um, I've, I've been in touch with the nurses on the whole thing and it's amazing that they gave up their time pro bono. All those surgeons and, mm -hmm. and doctors and nurses gave up their time pro bono to sort him out. But he's, uh, he's been one of the lucky ones who's been able to get assistance, but it's still not the end for him. I mean, he's got to go and live life with a disfigured face. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's horrible and, and it's rough. And we've just got to remember that these are wild creatures that we're living alongside and mm -hmm. we make plans to live with. And it's no, it's no different to living with lions. I mean, lions mm -hmm. do that. You get man-eating lions, you get man-eating leopards. There was a leopard in, in India that, that killed 125 people, one leopard. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, this stuff is happening. We've got to be aware of them and, and try and find ways to live with them. I think trying to live without them, you know, the problem is we, we're breaking ourselves away from nature so much that we're trying mm -hmm. to separate it. And we've got to live with them because they're always going to be there unless we destroy everything and then humanity is destroyed anyway. So we can't. And I mean, we humanity is ourselves. growing. Our populations are growing anyway. And we can't really, we can't really stop that. And we're now approaching more and more into wild spaces. So obviously we need to find ways. We need to find a balance to cohabit with these and also not encroach too much into their spaces. How can we get policymakers now to also understand this? Because when we're now building and we're, we're growing as communities, but we're also not uh, put, taking into consideration the conservation aspect, the animals, the wildlife, and even the pretty much the entire biodiversity. How can we get uh, policymakers to now be a part of this conversation? And what are you doing to ensure that more information about hyenas is out there and people understand it more? Yeah, what am I doing? I, you know, I'm trying to you know, do as much as I can through my media, through my films. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe the problem is, which I'm finding quite seriously with them, is um, if they see hyenas come up, they just keep carrying on surfing because they're not interested. They just don't want to see hyenas. So it's much mm -hmm. like, I've likened it to, to rats. Humans don't uh -huh. like rats. It's a yeah. standard thing. And yet there's some who love rats, they have them as pets. There's some people that go on talent shows with rats. We use rats for sniffing out landmines. Sort of uh -huh. They're amazing animals. And yet, we have this thing where we don't like rats. And hyenas fit the same, they, they're in that same mold, unfortunately. So to try and break that is really, really hard. And I, through my media and my interactions with them, mm -hmm. I'm hoping people will realize because when you see what I do, I don't feed them, and, and that mm -hmm. is crucial. And, and so the relationship I have with them is purely through mm -hmm. love and affection. And these hyenas come to me for a scratch and a tickle and whatever, purely for that love and affection, because mm -hmm. I'm not feeding them. And so my relationship with hyenas is very different to your relationship with your dog and your cat, because you have to feed those guys. So I have an mm -hmm. incredibly, really, really special relationship with these animals, because they come to me because they want the affection. And that's the amazing yeah. thing. And I think more people can and just open up their eyes and want to try and understand it. We'll, I think more and more of us will, will learn to live with them. And, you know, when you look at how dogs were domesticated, they came from wolves. Now, mm -hmm. why weren't hyenas domesticated? Because when you see what hyenas do and how they interact with me, they're far mm -hmm. more loving than a wolf or a dog. They're as loving as any of the best loving dog you can find. So really? why didn't we ever habituate them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because all of this witchcraft and all of those beliefs, people couldn't get that out of their minds. Mm -hmm. And so they wouldn't go near them and they, they just stayed away from it. So, yeah. And then, yeah. And Definitely. And then there's the, I, I forgot to ask this when I was asking about hyena behavior. They seem to laugh um, 
And I had a friend who, when I told her I'm going to be hosting um, this live with you, and she's like, hyenas, apparently, the reason why we also feel like they're part of witchcraft is because they'll be laughing at us at night. So tell me a little bit more about the laugh of the hyena, if, if there is such a thing, if they actually really do laugh. Totally, totally, totally. I mean, I'll, I'll, so this is this is basically how hyenas laugh. <laughs> wow! I think and that's what they do when they get excited. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. They're not laughing at us. They take that take that out of the equation. They're not laughing at us. They're laughing mm -hmm. because they're doing something exciting. Um, if they're going to attack lions, they sometimes do that. If that one's got a piece of meat and he's running away from another, he'll be laughing like that because he's just playing this fun game. And they, they do it at, at certain times. But, and sometimes it's a, it's a stress, slight stress-related thing. But they do mm -hmm. laugh just like we do. They, very much like we do. I mean, it's insane. It's, it's the best thing So ever. they will actually literally be laughing, laughing? Or is it just a way of communicating with each other? No, it's a, it's a communicate. So they're not... Their laugh doesn't mean what our laugh means. Their laugh yeah. means a very different thing and in different situations. So, no, it's a communication thing, but it, mm -hmm. it, it just sounds like our laugh. But, yeah. <laughs> well, every time I hear hyenas, I remember I was in the Wange National Park and we were doing a game count, and literally I heard these hyenas. I was like, oh my gosh, hyenas. I wasn't sure if. I would be safe, but I was like, but I know Kim interacts with these guys, so I should be okay. But when we were walking with you, we started, we were traveling with you and we went to the den and we saw the white, it looks like chalk, right? And you're like, we're definitely close yeah. to the hyenas. And I'm like, why do you say we're close? Because we're seeing this chalk. Where's this white chalk coming from anyway? And you explained that that is the hyena species explain where that comes from because well i know hyenas mostly scavenge on the bones and all but explain how that process all works out to then have white feces no, they don't they don't only have white feces they also have mm -hmm. sort of normal colored ones or the darker ones and stuff. but uh -huh. when they've been eating a lot of bone then it'll come out like that it comes out properly right and it's just all calcium from all the bone that they're eating so they don't, they're not getting much out of that bone. They're going for the bone marrow and stuff inside, which is what it's all about. And so they're eating the bones at the same time. But um, yeah, and, and when, it's, when it actually comes out, it's not white. It only goes white mm -hmm. when it dries. It's a sort of mm -hmm. greenish color when it comes out. But, um, and then sometimes you'll find what these hairballs, because they're mm -hmm. eating a lot of hair and hooves and things, they, they, mm -hmm. cough, they can't digest that hair. So they'll cough mm -hmm. them up, and these big, you'll find these balls of hair lying on the ground in places where they've coughed up the stuff mm -hmm. that they've eaten. Now, well, that's really amazing stuff about hyenas there, and you've been with them like that. But we're talking about how they are scavengers, and you did mention that they also do hunt. But I've I've never really encountered any hyena hunt. Explain to us how that happens, and if it happens, how often it happens, and what kind of animals that they actually do hunt? So, you know, in most areas where there's good prey population, hyenas are hunting probably 70 to 80% of what they eat. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of that will be impala, but they can take down anything. I know they take down sub-adults, elephants even, down to, mm -hmm. but a lot of it would be impala. And I've been with them and hunting in parlor and they're very specific in the animal that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. They were running past in parlor right to them. They didn't go mm -hmm. near those. There was one over there. That was the one they wanted and they targeted that one. And mm -hmm. if you've done some analysis on that, you probably would have found that in parlor was sick or had old or had something wrong with it. So they're mm -hmm. quite specific in, in targeting the lame, the sick. And that sort of thing. So, um, but they also have incredible stamina. I mean, there's a case in the Kalahari mm -hmm. where they chased an eel in 23 kilometers and killed it. So they mm -hmm. do have incredible stamina. They can run for 
But oh, I was going to ask. I was going to ask how fast they actually run. If they can actually run that fast to actually then be able to catch some prey like that. They they run fast, but they also it they it's with stamina. So not wild dogs are running a lot faster over quite mm-hmm. a long distance. You know, maybe a kilometer or so, but at at extreme speed, hyenas are mm-hmm. running not as fast but further. They mm-hmm. have the more stamina. And then you'll find they also work together in hunting. If there's an injured animal, like a, something big, like a you know, sub mm-hmm. elephant or whatever, they'll mm-hmm. run around it and around mm-hmm. it and keep moving the side and they're exhausted that way and eventually get it down. I saw them at Malilangwe killing a zebra stallion. And that was, you know, that's a wow. big animal and a strong animal. Yeah. And it, was, it was amazing to see. Um, it mm-hmm. was actually quite poorly and rough to see this. Um, the other thing with these guys when they kill something, they kill really quickly. You know, it looked mm-hmm. to our eyes, it looks terrible because they're pulling the stomach out and everything. You know, an impala mm-hmm. probably dies in 30 seconds when because they're just yeah. ripping and ripping and then it's dead. Yes. Whereas when a lion or a leopard kills a hunt, or even a cheetah mm-hmm. kills an impala, it yeah. three, four, five minutes to Whereas a mm-hmm. hyena's 30 seconds is done, that's it. Um, so, they don't, it doesn't look great, but far more efficient. And and they work together a lot, you know, in these hunting strategies. Yeah. So, yeah, just amazing. Mm-hmm. And you've been and you've been out there and you've been filming um, all this work that's been happening. Um, sorry for the hustle and bustle that's happening here. But you've been out here and you've been, fil- uh, you've been filming everything. You've been filming the hyenas. You've dedicated m- most of your time, if not all of your time, to literally filming within the wild. Obviously, you didn't start off like this. What is it that made you decide, I want to go out and I want to start filming in the wild and focus on hyenas and bring out this work? Well, it, it happened by chance, you know, um, actually the very, I was in, asked to start filming with a guy, Richard Goss, 33 years ago. And I worked with him for six years, but then um, I was doing a film for National Geographic on hyenas and mm. none of, none of what I'm doing today would, would be happening if it wasn't for this event that I'm going to tell you about. So mm. I'm sitting on the ground and I'm filming these hyenas over there and this one hyena approaches me and I'm thinking I better get in the car and I thought well, maybe let me just maybe I'll just sit there. so I sat there with my camera my big camera and I'm filming and the hyena comes up to me so I hold out my hand and I think okay it's either going to sniff it lick it or bite it so I must just mm-hmm. be prepared for some, for some and none of that happened she came up to okay. me and she put her chin on my hand and then I thought, okay, what if I start scratching you now? Are you going to bite mm-hmm. me? So I started scratching her neck. And just like when you scratch a dog's neck, oh, she looked yeah. it up like, oh, oh, yes, oh, 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 yes, I want more. And mm-hmm. so every time, from that day on, every time I mm-hmm. got out the vehicle, she would come for scratches. Wow. And that's how this all started. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I would never have trying to do anything with a hyena because of the reputation and everything we th- mm-hmm. think we know about them, I would never do it. And mm-hmm. that very interaction changed me. And mm-hmm. the head of National Geographic, having seen, having seen this footage and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. he likened it to that famous photograph of the chimp coming and touching Jane Goodall on the forehead. And uh-huh. when you think about it, it's exactly the same thing. She used to live with these chimps, work with them and whatever, and then they came to interact with it. This is the mm-hmm. same thing. The hyenas are coming to me and mm-hmm. the interaction is happening. Why that hyena did that, I don't know. And why it's happened since. So that was, mm-hmm. that was uh, like 15 years ago. And I've done it now with four mm-hmm. clans of hyenas in different areas. Mm-hmm. And they're coming for this, this love and affection. It's just, it's, it's insane. And that's why I believe if we can educate people and get them mm-hmm. to understand this animal, we can all live very peacefully together. Oh, that shows how important you are and filmmakers are in this whole equation in educating nations and masses, um, helping them understand the intrinsic and extrinsic value of hyenas or just our, our biodiversity as a whole. So now with your films, 
and you're trying to also educate i love the work that she did with queen hyena and ryan here says besides predators of war have you ever filmed about lion documentaries tell me more about some of the documentaries that you've filmed and the reach that you've gotten from all these that you've filmed in your entire career so yeah thanks ryan um predators of war um actually got two emmys won two emmys so that was great but it was you know, it was a hard hitting film in that it it showed wildlife for what it really is you know we watch a lot of wildlife movies and they toned down all the killing and all that sort of stuff predators at war mm-hmm. really showed it for what it is not with lion leopard cheetah hyenas and wild dogs all mm-hmm. of them warring with each other one way or another um i've so what i've done doing with the hyenas i've done with leopards i've done mm-hmm. with wild dogs and i've done mm-hmm. with cheetahs um and the, and the hyenas and but not lions and i don't intend to try and do what i do with lions it's not happening but i'm not going there <laughs> um i'm with you I, there <laughs> wait but we've got the lion lions whisperer. how does that work and i know you guys interacted just very recently yeah 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 i mean what can what the lion whisperer does is insane is unbelievable and i don't know how he gets it right i think it's mm-hmm. phenomenal and he's his experience in surpasses anybody else out there he's phenomenal yeah just an amazing guy and doing exceptional stuff with lions but um you know with wild lions out here i don't think no i i, I won't do it I, it's not going to happen <laughs> um i think the you know the, the beauty about hyenas is they're so mm-hmm. intelligent you know they've done tests with active hyenas and chimps and the hyenas mm-hmm. outsmarted the chimps on several occasions So these things are highly intelligent and okay. when you're dealing with a lion the lion just got big muscles he's just got big guns he's got nothing else mm-hmm. he's actually mm-hmm. quite dumb <laughs> so, I see you have a thing against you, lions is that it no, no, it's no, because no. of the no no, no, no. <laughs> I love lions I respect lions and I think they're amazing but they just mm-hmm. don't do what hyenas do for <laughs> And uh, well, of, I'll of course you would say to, that to Kim of course you would say that <laughs> But yeah you're talking about the reach yeah. that you've had with your with your films and your documentaries and um coming from Zimbabwe talking about Zimbabwean issues and letting them be seen by the entire world um the reach that you you've got Oh, how are you utilizing that and how do you think even governments especially the government of Zimbabwe can also ride on your platforms to ensure that we do talk about our country and people get to understand what Zimbabwe has to offer so i think i think the most important thing is you know a lot of these films get I mean other people are making films in Zimbabwe as well but mm-hmm. does zimbabwe ever get to see the films that are made here i mean we there's a lot of international films that go out around the world and zimbabweans don't get to see it so i think yeah. more importantly than showing the world yes we want to show the world to show them you know we have amazing wildlife in this country and and that will happen mm-hmm. through the movies but we need to come back home here and mm-hmm. broadcast our stuff locally so i'm working on a show now which is going to be two half hour episodes a week and uh-huh. i'm I've, i think i'm getting it right to get the rights to mm-hmm. zbc that they can have this to be part of the country mm-hmm. and and i think that's that's so important that you know local people are seeing what we have because without yeah. the local buy in it's not happening yeah and then it also obviously the show is going to go internationally as well that that's an mm-hmm. no brainer and it'll have all the effect that we wanted to have but it I think more importantly it's got to come here and and be seen more everybody. No, well, people have to take ownership of what they have first before we can even sell it out to to the world and talking about ZBC I'm excited. I can't wait to see you tomorrow as we are launching uh the ZBC goes wild. Uh, so ZBC uh, for those that are not from Zimbabwe or don't understand it's the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation and it's Zimbabwe's national broadcaster. And um Wild Aid has partnered with ZBC and we will be uh launching this partnership tomorrow. And Kim is going to be part of um 
the people who are going to be speaking on the panel and he's going to talk to us a little bit more about his conservation journey and how important it is and now getting your stories onto zim tv as well and getting people to now understand this story how do you feel about that and that importance and making sure that people actually do take ownership of what they have before they can even sell it out into the entire world so i think it's important that i get to do that and how we need to see how people are reacting to it and, and be able to yeah. in positive engage with them to improve those mm-hmm. interactions or whatever they are we we can have a positive effect so that's why i'm excited about going local and and putting it out here so that there is some proper engagement and um mm-hmm. you know i i a lot of if you said all this negative stuff about hyenas i mean i've mm-hmm. told by i gave a guy a lift one Me, mm-hmm. you know if you touch a dead hyena you you will die i mean just a oh, while wow. okay for you going to die and i i didn't want to go there in further into the conversation and asking well, what happens if i touch a live hyena what then mm-hmm. am i going to explode or what <laughs> <laughs> i but those are the going to mutate <laughs> yeah <laughs> so those are the things we've got to really do with, with the locals and and mm-hmm. and more so with not people in the cities but the local people living on our boundaries our yeah. neighbors we need to really build with them and that's that's hugely important tell well i'm really excited about that and i'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow but now i just need to ask you about the balance with family and all that and i know you have been living in the bush now for quite a while i saw your beautiful house um that is also very eco friendly and i saw saskia joining us saskia your wife and i'm excited i'm excited that she's here hello sas um just give me a wave please i miss you i hope you're well <laughs> so um how do you balance that with family and how <laughs> she where is she i saw but i know i saw her joining with her device somewhere but yeah I don't know how you balance that <laughs> the family aspect and you're out in the wild how did you get them to be okay with living in the wild have they always wanted to be in the wild uh, did you go in there just recently with them did they just join you recently i have so many questions that need answers no uh, so i mean they it was a no brainer that they were going to join me in the wild Yeah. Um and they love living up here and, and to to bring up a kid in this environment it, it doesn't get much better. Um mm-hmm. but I spend a lot of time out filming I'm out filming about 16 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And Saskia <laughs> Saskia will tell you that I spend more time with my hyena than I spend with her. And mm-hmm. that's a real problem. um and so much so that we actually going to now be working a lot together they're going to come out mm-hmm. with me a lot more we'll be out for them all night kiki and saskia will be on the back of the vehicle or saskia will be mm-hmm. on the front of the vehicle we all going to be for each other and it's going to be the family in the wild basically doing our thing out there um mm-hmm. as we go about making this film on hyena So well I'm looking forward to a film something. about you as a family in the wild as well. <laughs> well that's what the the thing that we're going to be doing that's what it's about. Those two mm-hmm. two half hour episodes a week is going to be about mm-hmm. us making this movie and then obviously at the end of it mm-hmm. we'll have the final movie. But to start with it's just going to be that that skill itself. I'm excited but how do you how do you manage it so um I know Kiki a oh, very beautiful very intelligent young lady and I miss her, her she's very funny I miss her, her excuse moi you know pardonnez-moi she says pardonnez-moi right <laughs> how are you going to get her to school for example how is that going to work um how are you going to balance that or is she going to be homeschooled are you going to I don't know get someone to come and teach her stuff are you going to ship her somewhere explain No she's definitely not going anywhere the <laughs> so one of the, the one issue we have is she doesn't get enough interaction with other kids there are other kids that come down every now and then but she's not getting mm-hmm. enough interaction so that's that's the only problem we have out here otherwise education it's all there on our fingertips it's all on mm-hmm. google 
we can check that all out. So we're going to sort of homeschool her, but doing a thing mm -hmm. called unschooling. So as soon as she has an interest in something, mm -hmm. you help her to find out more about it. And Google is there to help you do any, to find out about anything. And, yeah. and then you grow it there. So she's not in the, this formalized school system where you have to go to school, you have to do maths, you have to do science, mm -hmm. you have to do whatever. And she's going to do the things that really interest her and we'll help her mm -hmm. grow those things. And to intrinsically learn how to speak English and do mm -hmm. basic maths. Uh, all of those and a little Shauna here and there. Things. Oh, yes. I actually remember Sass telling me that she's learning quite a bit of Shauna as well. Well, I guess our maid is not allowed to speak a word of English to her. And sometimes I catch her and I said, Shani, is that, is that Shauna? Ah, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> So she's very good at speaking. Shona, Shona, I don't. I'm learning, mm -hmm. but she understands Shona. She doesn't speak it because I'm sure she can, but she's just not doing mm -hmm. it. It'll come. So no, no, she'll be speaking Shona soon. soon. Well, I know you try to throw in those Shona words. You're talking about the Shumbas. Someone was saying, hey, go easy on the Shumbas there in the comments. And you put in Nyama in there. And, you know, it's it's good. I'll, I'll try to teach you. I'll help you out. I'll talk to you in Shona. Uh, okay. Soon after this live, I'll be talking to you in Shona through and through. So um, there's a guy here who has literally sent a comment. I think it's Baron Films. He says, if it wasn't for Kim and the opportunities that he gave me, I wouldn't have been the filmmaker that I am today. So now talking about um, him saying you managed to assist him, I'm not too sure about what kind of opportunities you um, offered him and how you assisted him, but how have you been assisting filmmakers and what have you been doing with your talent and your reach and uh, your influence to also get more filmmakers to be recognized and to just figure out their passion? No, exactly. And, and I want to do more of that. Byron worked with me for, for many years and he's gone out to be a filmmaker on his own. He's doing exceptionally well, doing fantastic work. So yeah, well done, Byron. And how's it? Um, and there have been a few, I mean, I've, a few people that have worked with me have gone on to do much better things than, than I've done. Uh, another one, Richard Slater Jones has been amazing. Dale Hancock, mm -hmm. incredible. Um, really good mm -hmm. But in Zimbabwe, um, I had a couple of twins here the other day. <laughs> so these mm -hmm. are twins, and their names are Roland and Donald. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay. The only way I could tell the difference between them every day, I had to look at their shoes. But um, mm -hmm. they were they were from up north in the country, and mm -hmm. I'd heard about them. They to become filmmakers yeah. and stuff. So I brought them down for. a and they went out with me for a week and we mm -hmm. just went around filming as I do. So I, mm -hmm. I do want to do more of that. Um, get local people. If, if mm -hmm. you know of anybody or whatever that's interested in the um, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to have them down for a week or whatever and just try and, and try and build them and, and do what we can. Because I think there, there is a lot of talent in this country and mm -hmm. it just needs, it needs exposure to especially filming i mean filming wildlife is not easy it's not just your ordinary i'm going out and i'm filming um you have to understand uh, your surroundings you need to know how to handle yourself within the wild so there's so many things that they would need to understand how did you get to understand some of these things did you grow up in the wild um uh, were your parents um i don't know sort of part of wildlife or conserv were they conservationists tell me more about how you actually got into it into understanding how to manage yourself in the wild well i was one of those very very lucky people my grandfather was the very first mm -hmm. game ranger in the kruger national park my father oh, wow. was the senior ranger in the kruger national park so i grew up in kruger um, except my dad died when I was five, so we had to leave. So that's where my my interest in everything comes in. Although I've got a twin brother, you would think he'd be the same. But he's a, a very successful engineer. He's living in. You in have South a twin Africa. brother. Does he so, actually look like you? Are you identical twins? 
No, not at all. Saskia even wonders if we're brothers. She can't see anything <laughs> similar in us. <laughs> oh my gosh. I would love to see a picture of him. I am going to DM you and try to find out. I need to see what he looks like. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so I was fortunate to grow up and I've always had this interest in wildlife. So whenever I could, I would go to the bush and then even in my university holidays i would be in the bush in swaziland learning there i learned i think i learned just about everything i knew about the bush from ted riley in swaziland who is the king's advisor to conservation and i spent all my holidays working with ted um, amazing stuff there and then uh, so that's how i got into it and, and understanding animal behavior is key to being a, full, a wildlife filmmaker you've got to understand animal behavior and how it works and because you know even just looking at an animal's tail, for instance, yeah. when an elephant lifts up its tail, it's scared. When mm -hmm. a dog wags its tail, it's excited. When, when a lion's tail is wagging, it's about to eat you. So mm -hmm. you've got to know all these different nuances in all the different animals and understand all of that. So that's key. And, you know, I, I think a lot of filmmakers, mm -hmm. wildlife filmmakers, are filmmakers before they became wildlife. Mm -hmm. I'm the other way around. I'm a wildlife guy who's into filmmaking. Okay. And so I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about being in the field. I love, and that's why I spend 16 hours a day out there because that's where I want to be. I love it. And so I don't even, I don't even do post-production on my film because that means I'm three months out the field. I can't mm -hmm. handle that. I want to be in the field. So other people do the post-production for me. Wow. So yeah, I mean, it, it's key, but, in this country, it's really hard for people to get that that bush experience. And so yeah. those, those twins who came down, you know, they're great filmmakers, but they didn't have the bush experience. So they need to get to understand more of that. And that's what we need to try and build, yeah. And you're talking, you're talking about Roland and Ronald, right? I mean, they're here. I see them in the comments. Roland and Ronald watching. We had an opportunity of a lifetime learning from Kim. He's the best. I think you, I think you paid them to say this. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Roland and Ronald, <laughs> I'm coming for you. But I'm already seeing, <laughs> I've already seen two people who... Um, well, two different organizations now because they're not organizations. The twins, I, I can count them as one because, well, yeah, Roland and Ronald. You've already mentored so many people who have gone to, to do so much. So I'm thinking we should find a way. I'm a journalist. I'm in the broadcasting sector. So why not come up with a partnership of sorts and we can try and get more people to sort of subscribe to this. You get to teach them what you've learned. Um, and we can see how it's going to help our nation and eventually help Africa as a whole, yeah? No, I, I totally. And, and getting it from your perspective, I think, is, is fantastic. Just your perspective on hyenas is very different to most other people's perspective on them. And your perspective is the local perspective, which is what we really need to understand and to work with and to change yeah. people's minds to get that. You know, internationally, we might not get people to understand hyenas, but if we can get local people, I mean, if we change mm -hmm. Zimbabweans to think like Ethiopians, that would be phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but not just hyenas. I think I would, I would love to, to work well with you and, and mm -hmm. with your contacts and stuff, get more people down here who need the experience and who I can, you know, just help in some small way. It would be fantastic, mm -hmm. yeah. So I see this on purpose on the Instagram Live so that I'll have witnesses and that when you then decide we're going to be doing this, we're going to do this and you've got no choice. So you have been bound by the social media gods. Um, but now, just so we close off, we're nearly running into our hour. Um, any advice that you would have to would-be filmmakers um, who want to get into the wild and any advice to people who actually want to understand animal behavior and how best we can even get the hyena off the problem animal list in our country, if that's even possible. Yeah, you know, getting the hyena off that list, um, I think, is is a is a tough one. Um, 
but it, it, it needs to happen before they exterminate it and nobody even cares. Um, mm -hmm. But just, you know, other people getting involved, I mean, use your social media, use it all the time. And, and as, especially young people trying to get into the industry, you've just got to give yourself freely and, and just show your passion. And I think a lot of it is, I would love to get the ministry to, the Ministry of Information and Media to, mm -hmm. when, whenever an international crew comes into the country, they have to take on one local person um, as part of the film crew. And that way, if, if the guy, the local guys are keen and passionate and they show how, you know, dedicated and whatever they are, yeah. then the international guys will pick that up and then move them next time. And, and that's how we can grow our people getting out mm -hmm. the internet, you know, getting into the internet. So it, I think if the ministry could do that, and it, it wouldn't have to be a cost factor for them. You know, I think these yeah. guys might have to work for free. So they have to have these people go along with them on the shoot. Because mm -hmm. I think as soon as you start speaking, oh, you have to have so many people and your cameraman has to be local and this and this, you're going to kill it. It's not going to work. But I think yeah. if, they have to, if they just take on a volunteer each time, I think that would be, be a huge thing. And then these people can show their passion and, and what they know and everything, and that can grow it. I really think that's very important. And you talk about the ministry, and the good thing is we get to sit down with the Ministry of Information tomorrow. And um, you and I have a task now when we are sitting down with the minister and we explain to her, these are some of the things that we need to do. And these are some of the policies that actually need to be put in place. Um, what kind of legislature do we have? How can we actually ensure that we're also growing our film industry in the country? Zimbabwe's film and entertainment industry isn't that big. And a lot can still be done to ensure that we also use it to even market our country. So I feel like this conversation is very important. And I'm excited that I managed to talk to you. And we've spoken about the hyenas. And we've spoken about your family. And about where you've come from. And the people you've mentored. I've learned so much already from this conversation. And I'm pretty sure so many more people have learned so much from the conversation. And so many people are still joining. So many people are saying um, hello from Nebraska. Nebraska. Well, hello there in Nebraska. Um, so we're literally having so many people listening in and tuning in from so many different places and so many different areas. And some of these places don't even have um, half the animals that we have in Zimbabwe. So we should encourage them to visit Zimbabwe and definitely come and see what we have. So I'm excited to also see the work you're doing with the movie that you are also starting, the 30 Minuta. And I'm excited about everything and looking forward to seeing more of your work and um, your advocacy for hyenas. And hopefully we won't see them on the verge of extinction. Um, where are hyenas when, when we talk about uh, being endangered, so to speak? Are they still safe or should we start being a little bit more careful? No, they, they are still very safe and mm -hmm. they're all over the place because they're so successful. But I did hear a couple of years ago that a hyena skin was being, being sold for twice the price of a leopard skin in Angola. And, you know, the concern for that is that if they, if they just carry on shooting a hyenas, nobody's going to know, nobody's going to care. And the mm -hmm. next thing they'll be gone. So mm -hmm. unless we create an awareness now, look, they're not in endangered, but if we don't create an awareness now, that might happen. And then yeah. our whole ecosystem is going to bump. I mean, we don't know how, how exactly how important hyenas are in our ecosystems. But if you look at mm. wool, how important they were just in Yellowstone alone, as soon as they reintroduced wolves into mm -hmm. Yellowstone, the whole ecology of the place went back to what it was, um, mm -hmm. just through wolves being there. So, yeah. you know, I'm pretty sure if you hyenas out of our system, they, they're so embedded in the system, if you take them out we're going to find some seriously bad knock-on effects and we can't afford yeah. that. Well, definitely that's important. So now I'm seeing everyone saying, um, hi, I'm tuning in from Doha. Hi, I'm from Harare. Um, I see the wandering conservationist and um, hello from a Zimbabwean in Virginia. I'm so excited that so many people here. Hi, Dylan, Harry, um, he is also joining us here. So it's, it's just amazing that we've got so many people joining and getting to 
uh, understand this conversation. And it's important that we start having more conversations like these so that we educate more people, more people are aware of what's happening in, in their surroundings and more locals understand what they have within their country. So thank you so much. And hello from Norway, Poetry7. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you everyone for having joined. And Kim, thank you so much. I don't know if you have anything to say to everyone who joined in anything that you want to say to them and just thank everybody no thank you thank you for having me rumi but i do want to say to, you know i whenever i go to film festivals and stuff and i tell people i'm filming in zimbabwe they say why but there's nothing left there and i would just like to tell everybody around the world that zimbabwe's wildlife is in extremely good shape we have everything here and it's extremely well looked after and managed so please come and visit because you will be surprised at what an amazing country and how successful the wildlife department is here. Indeed, I did mention earlier on, some may not have joined, and I mentioned how we've got literally the second largest population of elephants in the entire world. You do want to visit Zimbabwe and also the, the fourth largest population of black rhinos. So we have a great conservation story in Zimbabwe and we have great places and activities that people can come and so many stories that they can learn from. So really looking forward to more people coming to Zimbabwe. And John says this conversation was so important to hear and my opinion has forever changed. And I'm excited. Um, Wendy says, thank you guys. Very interesting. And we love Kim's work. I mean, who doesn't love Kim's work? And um, uh, there's Lara who says, excellent interview. Kim Walter is my absolute idol. Have read about his grandfather and et cetera, et cetera. I was so lucky to meet him last year. So already, um, I'm just excited at the engagement. And we need to do more of these and get more people involved and talk more, change people's opinions. And hopefully we can save our planet and save our wildlife. Thanks, Rumbi. You're fantastic. And I'll see you tomorrow night. Definitely. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow night. And thank you, Emiran. You said, can I say your name? Yes. Thank you so much for joining in on this uh, live. And we have to go now. I hope you all have a beautiful day. If it's day there where you are, a beautiful morning and a beautiful evening, um, wherever you are. Thank you so, so much for being a part of this. And thank you so much, Kim, um, for this. And thanks to Wild Aid for giving us this platform. I'm Rubita Kawira. I'm the Zimbabwe Wild Aid Ambassador. You should follow me, R-U-M-B-I-E Takawira. And you can see more of what I'm doing because I'm also starting a show talking about conservation. So these are conversations that need to be heard. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Kim. And say hi, my greetings to Sass and Kiki. Thanks, Rumbi. All the best. See you tomorrow. Hey, can't wait. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. Bye, everyone.